Welcome back everybody, this is Grace, and today I want to talk about all of the Golden Gift Box items just returned very recently. Um, so I'm going to be talking about them all while I hang out at the crossroads, and I'm going to do uh, some somewhere battles just for fun. I've got a basic um, FD Ranger setup, and um, in addition to that, what I'm going to be doing is switching in some item um, item tabs on the bottom of the screen. You should see one now. But let me know what you think of those item tabs. And let me know if you think they should change in format. If so, how so. And uh, we're just going to get right into it. But with that being said, I'm going to be talking about the golden gift boxes. And um, should be a good time. Alright, so let me just get set up here. We're going to use the dex boost and the burn boost but not the bleed, and then I've just got a bunch of random pets and guests. Should be a good time. Okay. Alright, so with all that set up, um, there were a lot of rare items that were brought back, and a lot of ultra rare items that were brought back. Uh, not rare as in unobtainable, rare as in rarity. But I'm going to start with the rare shop. So we have the... Oh, and before I get going... If you don't like being talked at and you prefer to read on your own, I'm pretty much going off of the Google Doc I made recently, which is linked in the description, and I recommend checking it out. <clears throat> so the Kasoma Pet and Guest. They're ice companions that do one hit, but toggle the three hits if they're able to eat a defense boost and deal greatly boosted damage. Um, if they eat enough defense boost, it's up to 3x damage, so it can be pretty huge. For things that compete with it, there's a boatload of quick cast defensive boosts, all of which can be used to boost these guys up to 3x their base damage. There's a couple of funky setups I was playing around with a while back to get cheaper death boosts for them. Stuff like uh, that one Grenwag armor, the Egg Deceiver or something, I don't know, Egg Trickster, forget what it's called, it's water light, dual compression. Anyways, um, and then the Eye of Nab, which is an interesting option, although I ended up deciding those weren't too great. Um, but anyways, the issue with death boosts as boosters is that a lot of death boosts take a 0.6x penalty for various reasons. Usually they're quick cast, but other times there's just a lot of penalties on them. So it can be really expensive to boost your pet and guest. But all in all, these pets can be boosted a ton and do the most damage. That being said, we do have Cryo Cannoneer for ice damage guests and Archmage Apprentice for ice damage pets. Um, which are quite significant. So those are really good options already. Do you need to spend a rare box on these? Maybe, maybe not. But that's uh, my opinion. If you want to really nuke a three-hit supercharged better guest, could be nice. So next up is the Fenona pet and guest. These are water and guest uh, water companions that toggle to pay half their damage to inflict burn uh, for two turns. Now, um, if you have other water burn options like Aquabot or the um, Drowned Rat, you definitely don't want these, or the Guest at least, because those are really good options and they're more expensive but better. If you don't have those yet, these are, they're just pretty good burn. Um, they're just pretty good burn options. They stack in power quite well because they're two turns. Um, if you're stacking with other burns of different durations, you might not see that happen as much. What is bleeding them? Oh, Berserk from the pet. Anyways, um, but you will get less overall power than, say, Aquabot or um, the Pyre Rat. But that being said, they're rare boxes, which are relatively cheap, and I don't think we have a water burn pet. Don't quote me on that, but I don't think we do. That's gold available, so pretty good option for its price. Next up is the Human Fisher Armor, which is a fully offensive water armor with a very cheap, I think like sub 100 SP weapon based skill, which is just nice. Um, there are very few, the reason I recommend this armor, at least a little bit, there are very few good FO water armors, at least as of the time of recording. Um, and for this reason, a basic fully offensive water armor with a two hit super low SP skill cost is pretty good compared to the competition. Uh, if you're a vampire player, probably use your vampire subrace over this. Well, maybe. Who knows? Um, if you're a werepire player, 
probably use your sub race, sub race over this, but situationally sometimes no. But it's a very good basic armor, and it does what it does very well. Next up we have the first of three illustrious savior items, and there's a lot of strong opinions about this one, but it's a water shield that I believe loses 3 MRM against normal monsters and gains 12 from boss monsters. There's a lot of good water shields though that compete with it. We have Celtic Wheel, Weird Ward, Starfish Stalwart, um, which can give you auto dodge. We even have Slime Barrier. Woo, no, I'm kidding. Armor's not not at its peak power. Um, but it's a water specific dodge shield, which can be nice. But that being said, um, there is another one, Logos, but that's rare, so if you don't have it, um, too bad, I guess. So you, this is your best option for dodge. But that being said, I really do like Weird Ward, Celtic Wheel, and Starfish Stalwart as options, and there's some other good ones too, I just can't think of them off the top of my head. Um, that being said, this shield is really efficient. You pay zero resources to get the dodge, because it's a trigger. So it can be nice, It, on average, very average, so keep this as a loose estimate, but it decreases your increase incoming damage by about 15% for no upkeep, which is nice, but compared to other water shields, I really like the HP to S or SP to HP for Star Wars Stalwart, I really like the auto dodge on one hits for Weird Ward, Celtic Wheel of course for mages, hard to beat. So wouldn't recommend this unless you really want to dodge with water, or you really want yeah, I don't even know, to be honest. The Illustrious Savior weapons are a water MRM swap weapon, and they do minus 10 damage against normal monsters, I think, uh, and they do plus 20% damage against bosses. Oh, and by the way, this boss trigger goes off the boss power. Um, you can't see it in-game on the normal client, but one thing you can do is you can turn on the music, and most of the time, the music should play the boss music if it's going to trigger for the weapon and shield. I haven't tested it extensively, but it should. Um, also just if it's a boss in general, it's probably going to trigger, although there have been a couple of power one bosses lately, so might not, but anyways, um, the main issue with this is like, it's nice to have an efficient blood blade against bosses, but there are just so many good melee magic and ranged water weapons for melee. We've got multi mall, oath of desire, blood blades, which people already have. There's some others too. I just can't think of it off the top of my head. For magic, there's like nine water spell boosting weapons to choose from. Um, for rangers, there's some token items. Unfortunate Umbrella is a token blood blade. Uh, the Shark Skewer is an LS item for FO rangers. If you um, use bleed to, well, you can use bleed to use the LS, but anyways, excuse me. Um, this weapon is very efficient against bosses. Not having to lose 50 HP a turn might be worth it for some people, but I just, I first of all, I would pick this weapon over a blood blade, especially since it's MRM swap. It's nice if you use multiple builds, change them out like I do. But it's just such a marginal, like increase, and it's there's so many other good weapons and items in water for weapons that I would just never probably use this. It is a rare box though, and I think it looks really cool. So up to you, of course, but I would not. Next up, one of the infamous items, Infinita Staff. It's a dark ranged to magic weapon. Um, which heals SP or MP based off the damage you deal. Um, and because it's based off damage dealt, it can absolutely go to the moon. So you, I, in an H3 setup, for example, you can heal like your full SP bar with a bit of boosting. It's crazy. Um, so I'd highly recommend you pick this up. Although the staff have looked at it and been like, ah, should probably get nerfed in the future. When that'll happen, who knows? Post Archimage release, who knows? not me. Um, but there's no real competition for this weapon in terms of restoring resources. It's damage based and it just it can just heal full SP, half your MP bar. It's just nuts. Um, definitely one of my top three picks for the items. Although it will be nerfed eventually so keep that in mind. But it's only a rare box too. Like you can go nuts with it. It's really fun to use this with the H series on a warrior and lock it to melee and still get the SP regen. Like it's it's really fun. Um, same with actually, you know, I forgot, but since Trickster Hide came out, you could use this and do the same thing, but for wind, really fun. Same with um, well, I'm not gonna list them all, but lots of really good ways to use this. 
The next up, and these are two bangers, one after the other, in alphabetical order, um, is the Pride Lord Companions. So, they're fire companions that toggle between paying extra SP to deal plus 50% damage and 3 hits, and then they toggle to give status potency and ice resistance. The pet, I think, gives 12 or 13 if you overcap it. The guest gives 15 and may or may not be able to ferocious strike. I'm not going to comment on that. Ooh, poacher captain. I've never seen this guy. Huh. Wildly interesting. Um, anyways, but they give status potency and ice defense, which... Is interesting. I think the guest gives 15 at full dex and charisma. It scales off dex and charisma. Um, so for competition, there are a few high damage fire pets and guests. Plush Nugget Pet, Firebot, Burning Pyre Rat, uh, and there's some more to be honest. I can't remember to list them all. Like there's a million fire pets and guests. Um, but none of those at all can compete with the status potency utility that Pride Lord has. The pet though competes with Spotter Drake, so I personally as a cheapskate, would not buy the pet because I like to use Spotter Drake for status potency instead. Um, but it's you know it's a great fire pet if you want a plus fifty percent damage fire pet. I think it's the cheapest option at the moment. Um, should be, anyways. So the guest absolutely nuts. I'd highly recommend for the status potency and for the damage. Um, the pet. Good for damage, less good for status potency, because uh, Spotter Drake exists and it's gold. Um, for ice defense, this is a cheaper option than both the Groundhog pet and the Kitsune pet and guest, although I think Groundhog defends a little bit more. Don't know about Kitsune, I'd have to check, but you're not really going to use ice defense very often because there are not really any hard ice bosses. Well, that's not fully... Uh, it's kind of true. There's very few of them, at least. This is... One of my top five for sure i don't know if it's top three but maybe for the price it's top three but in terms of like overall power not top three i'm not sure but really really good options highly 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 recommend the pet recommend still strongly but not quite as strongly the guest on the energy armor whoops let me fix that real quick okay so next up is the shadow flame glaive uh, it's a ranged zero proc weapon that inflicts dark burn based off its hit count, capped at 4 hits, and the dark burn is pretty strong, power 3.5, uh, and then each hit inflicts another turn. Um, honestly, for in terms of what this item does and what competes with it, there's not too many, or any, maybe, zero proc dark burn sources for rangers that I know of. That being said, burn is an FD, is generally better in an FD strategy. So I'll compare it to the 100 proc items that exist. Uh, there's one Dark Energy Compression Bow, Storm Shadow, um, that burns for dark, but it's like power two for one turn. Yeah, I think for one turn. So not ideal. Um, did I still, I kept the shield on energy, I'm so dumb. Anyways, that's why HP is so low. Anyways, um, there's also like, the Agony Bow or something that inflicts like a power 1 burn, so there's not much for inflicting strong burn. And while this weapon is FD, so you won't get that style bonus, you won't get that 1x damage um, in an FD armor, because it's 0 proc, you'll just be inflicting a lot more burn. If you're in a 2 hit armor, you'll inflict like 3 times, 3.5 times the burn at like, because 2 hits times power 3.5 is 7 power. If you manage to use a 4 hit armor, like Let's see, ice four hits. Oh, I can think of a nice. No, wait, we're looking for a light four hit armor because, you know, it's a dark weapon, so theoretically you'd be using light. I don't know of any light four hit basic attack armors, but there might be one or two. Anyways, even with two hits, it's a much more powerful burn. And on top of that, the save roll is minus 20 from the MC, so it doesn't lose power, and it's dex versus int. Int is a pretty uncommon monster stat. Um, so I would highly recommend it for that. The burn is very reliable. So all in all, I kind of rambled on, but strong dark burn, good for FO, good for good ish for FD, and very reliable save roll. Those are its strengths. Snake Master Strike. This is a dark overcharged four hit spell or skill. 
that inflicts a strong poison-ish and gives hypercrit. I think 4x hypercrit for two turns. Double check that though, because I kind of forget and I'm not gonna... Every, if I forget something I forget every time I go to the video and check another tab, like it'll take me three hours, so I'm not gonna do that. Kind of lazy, sorry, I'll put a text maybe. Um, an overlay. Anyways, rambling aside, I would not use this as a damage spell. Since so much of its power goes into the poison and hypercrit and it's expensive, it definitely cannot compete with Destruction Burst or Necromancer in general. Um, also, if you want to do hit count, Nocturnal Night Raiders is right there and it hits nine times. So, But that being said, nobody's really using this as a damage killing option. They're using it for either the poison or the um, hypercrit. Hypercrit is really rare for non-ultra rare items. So I think that that's just a huge selling point of this. You can give yourself a hypercrit modifier um, without an ultra rare box. There's a couple other items that do, but most of them are not that great for, or they have weaknesses where this one doesn't. Um, as for the poison, it's a nice poison. You can use it to trigger void forged. You can also use it to stack dark poison with, um, what weapon am I thinking of? There's that dark mage stave in the ultra gift boxes that can inflict dark poison. So it's pretty good. It's also a lot more poison than a soul steel spell from the, uh, French goo keep. I said that wrong, but who cares? Anyways, I think the strongest selling point though really is the times four hypercrit at a rare box price. It's just really good. Times four hypercrit with the lunar hair weapons, you're just instantly auto critting. So that and other synergies, for example, are really good. All right, I'm gonna grab a drink of water. and transition into the Void Awakening Wall. This is a fire shield with a normal type skill, so like White Knight C, for example. Um, on click, it costs 392 SP, and it does a good amount of damage. It has about 1.5 plus Ellie comp, so it does do damage, but, well, I'll just get into it when I talk about the comp competition for the item. So it is a good Ellie comp click skill, but shield skills are hard countered by damage caps and highly SP intensive, and they only scale with one or two stats. I think Void Awakening Wall is dex damage, so dex or int, um, like ranged or magic only, so warriors can't use it. I don't think, again, double check that, but you know, it's just like they, they can do huge damage, but they're nerfed by damage caps and there's just generally not a good way to use SP, in my opinion. That being said, I did have a lot of fun playing with shield skills um, and like nuking with them. So it is a fun item, but not like meta, I'd say. And finally, last of the rare boxes are the Zervana weapons. These are energy weapons that can cleanse bleed for a very low SP cost, I think like 40, 50, something like that. Um, yeah, it should be 50 or 49 or whatever but there's no real reason to cleanse bleed in 90% of situations and they don't do anything else. So these weapons, in terms of competition, this is just a standard damage weapon. So it gets out competed by like meta energy damage weapons, like, um, well, really like anything you can think of. Um, for cleansing bleed, nothing competes with them for how cheap and efficient they are. And it's quick cast too. So you can like swoop it into the weapon cleanse the bleed, switch back to another weapon. Um, so if you want that power against bleeding foes, go for it. But bleed is just such a rare status on monsters where it actually poses a threat to the player. There's like Saphira, the Bound Defiler, I guess Mason too. Um, I don't even know if you can cleanse those bleeds. They might be permanent on the Bound Defiler and Mason, but, but um, also there's other really good meta item cleanses. If you have Wing Weaver Shield, you should probably be running that. Um, for cleansing, if you're a necromancer, of course, you can just cleanse the bleed with the skill, the free skill. So it can help for Saphira specifically, so you don't have to waste a turn or waste a lot of SP cleansing it. But all in all, I'd say very much a luxury buy and only if you intend on fighting Saphira and want it to be a little easier or you don't have any other cleanses for whatever reason. But yeah, I wouldn't recommend these unless you have a purpose specifically in mind. 
All right, so we're on to the ultra rare boxes, which is exciting. The first one is one of my favorites, sort of, the Call Bloodhawk P spell. So it's a fire guest with a weird mechanic that slowly charges to ramp its damage. I think you can charge it up to 30 times and it'll give you like, I don't know, a little bit of balance damage on the max charges, um, on the basic attacks, but you can also blow up in a, in a self-destruct mode. And that is a nuke. That being said, it's a one-hit nuke. So, as for what it competes with, like I mentioned with Pride Lords, there's a lot of really good fire guests. Honestly, this guy competes with Pride Lord too. Um, but I actually don't have any idea how much damage this guy can output against bosses in turn one. Uh, the damage formula is super complicated, someone told me in the back end, so I'm told at least, but I'm led to believe it's really significant damage and it's based off of monster endurance, monster power, and how long the pet has been out. So if you have the pet out for many turns, the nuke will be less extensive. If you have the pet out in turn one and just blast off, it'll do more damage. Um, but it's one hit, so like any meta boss will have a damage cap or a plot armor, so it's not really too useful. It is cool though, it is really unique, that mechanic but probably not useful for 99% of gameplay situations. Next up are the Exalted Drone Pet and Guest. So these are companions that can do pure healing, which is multiplied by water resistance, or trade half their damage to do a ha uh, Ellie Shield, multiplied by enemy water resistance. So for direct competition, um, pets and guests, there's no water-based healing, uh, or at least HP healing pet and guest at the moment. And there's no Ellie Shield guests at all, I am pretty sure, unless you count the uh, Peace Zard, but that's a little bit outdated and a little bit crazy, but I won't count that. For the pet though, um, its niche of Ellie Shield got really weakened by Mermazon's turtle pet that came out because it's literally one-to-one, -one, same effect, Ellie Shield based off water resistance. Um, that being said, when I use the Ellie Shield pets, I don't like her green bow and the turtle. I don't really feel it or notice it. They're definitely significant, and it's nice that they are strong against like 130 or 140 res monsters, but it doesn't feel too great for me personally. I haven't tested it too extensively though, so take that with a grain of salt. But potions should be good. Doesn't matter. Nice. Um, level 67 Megog curious rather curious isn't it um that's the final boss i'll take it whatever one bang this hell anyways sorry the exalted drone guest i think is the real winner one because it's uh i think it's summon or call and you can have heal mana or hp excuse me so like funneling that into essence orb pretty good option and against high water resistance monsters it'll really just shoot to the moon doesn't take that always useful penalty that other healing guests do so it can just be way better. Finally, a new element. Tiger Luna Neko. I've got this Dex Drive Shield. Okay, well, no need to use it because now he's going to switch to Dark Damage. Hopefully I have the Luna 1 toggled on. Yeah, that would cause an issue. I've got the Nightfall Heroic Titan's Inspiration. I don't think I'm going to use it. Prisoner, at least not yet. But for Light... Light or ice, right? Okay. Don't think I have a light guest. I couldn't fit it in the slots. Well, I could have, but I was being lazy. Um, oh, and I, this is actually going to be funny. The snow angel. This guy is uglier than I remember. Damn. Probably wouldn't have picked him if I remembered that, but oh well. But he seeks between ice and light, so that's convenient. And I forgot to switch weapons, but... um. Anyways, finishing off the exalted drone pet before I get any more distracted. The guest, I'd say, is higher priority because there's less overlap in the guest slots, and the Ellie Shield is going to be about 20% stronger or 50% stronger than the pet version. I don't know how good they are, I don't know how great they are, I haven't played with them myself, so I'm not too strong on my think this is great, think this is poor, think this is okay, I'm not too confident, but that's what they do, and that's what they compete with. I think I'm going to use the Blizzard remote, just for fun. Oh 
want the ice attack. There we go. It was set to that initially, but I forgot. Um, but anyways, I got pretty distracted. So what we're gonna do now is I don't I don't care if he keeps attacking with fire. It doesn't really bother me. Um, what we're gonna do now is talk about the graves and weapons. So these are just earth dark compression weapons, but they cost an ultra weapon. Big yikes. That being said, for things they compete with, I don't know of any other earth dark compression weapons, but it's definitely not worth an ultra box for 99% of the player base, unless you're doing some really funky compression stuff. I like, unless unless you know you want this, because you're like, oh, I'll fit this in on my build and then I'll open up my light weapon slot so I can put in, like, no, just, just do not buy this. All right, here's a big one. Gonna drink a, a drink of water before I get to this. And I'm going to make sure I don't die. Okay, should be good. Hopefully this guy's SP attack isn't dark. If it is, I'll be fine. Oh, 105. Oh, no, that's fire. Okay. Dragon Gloss back, by the way. Anyways. Illustrious Savior of Battleon armor. It's a fully offensive water armor that gains... 20% damage or 12 MRM against bosses, and both if used with the full set. So this is an FO water armor, so you'd think when they had the chance to make an FO water armor, they'd make it good. Not the case. I think it's never worth it for almost anyone at the moment. Just don't get it. It's technically super efficient because you're paying zero resources to get a blood blade and like a logos defense. But the benefits are just, they're small enough, and it does nothing else aside from basic attack, that it's just not worth it, in my humble opinion. Infinite Dark Caster, though, is an energy spellcaster lean armor that has a built-in MP spell, which pays half its damage to inflict a harm poison, and just does damage with the other half. It also has a toggle to inflict a harm poison on any spells, and both of these toggles, or both of these poisons, spend half their damage to heal MP, which is kind of fun. We don't have too many MP siphons. MP drain poisons. Um, and, in general, I love spellcaster lean armors. I think they're great. And we love MP restoration effects. And this armor does both. Its direct competition is the Thunderbride armor, which is an energy SC lean armor with a two-hit MP spell, which does pure damage. Um, they kind of do different things. Like, if you want to nuke with energy, of course you want Thunderbride. If you want to sustain you want uh, Infinite Dark Caster. If you're going to spend an uh, Ultra Rare on one Spellcaster Lean Armor, I would recommend it be Ice Necro because that's the only one that isn't covered by other gold cost gear. Hmm, interesting. Hidden Sky with Dark, okay. Um, I think Solid Gold Luna Necro is my light one. Yeah, okay. hit him with dark with the silent stars um but the poison oh, the one thing i don't like about this armor or i think weakens this armor is that the poison is harm not energy which means that half the skill doesn't get ellie comp applied to it so that's like the con of the effect um that being said i think this armor is really good for using without ellie comp in mind so energy armor you use water spells and we have some efficient water spells and we have a ton of spell boosters which you can make pop off with this so I think it's I think it's not great as an Ellie comp armor, but it's great as a energy dealing with energy monsters water or with water spells armor. I haven't tested it out myself though, so I don't want to theorycraft like crazy and change your guys' opinions on stuff that I don't even know if it works well. But all in all, pretty good spellcaster lean armor, not the highest priority like Ice Necro because we don't we have um we do have a gold cost energy armor, but I do like it. Also, Dark Visor pet real quick. He does death loss, and I kind of like it. Don't know if he's ever going to hit against this guy. But, we'll see. So the next item is the Maw of Chaos. This is a dark weapon, which can basically, at quick cast speed, pay 40% 
or 40 HP um, to deal to deal um, or to give you a 15% darkness alien power. That's nice to have, but it's a 15% damage boost and it's halved for spells. That being said, there's no other weapon that gives you a quick cast darkness damage boost. I think actually maybe Alchemical Unity does, but who knows what that thing does, I forget. Um, so like it's a, it's a niche. It's a small niche because 15% damage is nothing like crazy, probably not worth an ultra rare for 99% of people. But if you love nuking with darkness, uh, go for it. Alright, now I gotta switch to my earth setup. I think I brought Devoured Vengeance just to see how it looks because I kind of forgot. And we'll go with the... Um, what weapon? We'll use the water weapon. Why not? And I'll use, let's see... Chibi Loco, because he gets a buff during April. Just for fun, of course. I think Mogden should be attacking with energy damage because his things are swapped. Yeah, he is. Okay. Using him for not the paralyze mode. Just for fun. No real reason. Um, but yeah, Mav Chaos. Dark damage boost, but it's small enough that unless you're a huge whale, probably not for you. So the Prometheus armor is a fully defensive energy armor, and it comes with an inherent int plus dex boost, which happens when the monster hits you. Caps at 4 hits and about a 50 def uh, stat boost. And it has a bad spell type skill that inflicts hyposalinate. Um, as for what it competes with, there's not a boatload of great FD energy armors. There's the two Neko variants, and there's Quester's Heavy Gunner, and there's bulk for compression. Um, but that being said, this armor, I just think it's dog water. I've never used it, so I could be off, but it's, um, like, it gives you, it gives you main stat, which is good. I normally support that. But the thing is, if you're using it, it only gives you interdex, so you'll be a major ranger. And if you're a ranger, Neko is just better, because it gives you main stat and luck. And if you're a, a mage, Quester's Heavy Gunner's MP shield is really good. Um, Hayers will say it's not, but most of the time it is. Sorry, I drank some water, but... So all in all, I just do not think that this armor is really good. Could be. I mean, the skill does inflict hyposalinate, but... I don't know. I'm very skeptical of this armor. So next up, another item I'm super skeptical of is the... Let me just get my, uh... My light setup going. I'm not too worried about the energy damage. No, it is zero. I'm kind of worried about it. Um, but the Randor pet. It's a trash fire pet that has a harm, at least seek trigger against dragons. It does like 1.1x damage. Just never use this. It's so bad. There's better dragon trigger pets, I think. There might not be, but it's an ultra rare and it does like 5% more than an MC to damage pet. Just don't use it. Just don't. It's not worth it. Okay. So with that being said, Randor's gotta be like my least favorite item in the returnings. Because it's ugly too, like there's no redeeming factor. It's not like Save Your Battle Arm, which is pretty, but this one's just terrible. Alright, so the Seraphim of Bear Armor is a fully defensive light armor with a, I say quote unquote, good one turn charge up spell type skill. It just gets a big damage buff and an LS um, item synergy, and we have the Scythe of Serenia, which is a really good light spellcasting weapon for lucky strikes. And it has a quick cast universal BTH boost, so your pet and guest also get affected which is a really rare feature. That being said, it's an FD light armor, but there's no inherent warrior lean synergy. And it does have a lot of competition, too. There's a boatload of great FD light armors, Paladin, the Neko variants, Shenya, Retro Golden. I think there might be one or two more. There's a couple of compression armors, like uh, that one that one rider armor and, um, and bulk, but... You know, is what it is. Um, that being said, the damage skill is kind of unique. The only thing that competes with it is Paladin for that. Um, so, you know, it's not it's not like it's trash. But I think unless you're gonna use the, um, unless you're gonna use 
the BTH boost as like a quick cast in and out thing, or you're going to use the spell type skill with LS synergies, Lucky Strike synergies, I'd say probably not worth it for you. So, next up, one of my one of the best items, the Time Killer spell. It's quick cast, it gives 2x LS with the Hypercrit status, and 50 luck for 3 turns. It's multiplicative with every other LS modifier that isn't Hypercrit, um, and I highly, highly recommend this for any Lucky Strike build users. As for what competes with it, pretty much nothing. It, I wrote this down, but it cannot be overstated how powerful this effect is. If you stack it with any crit source that isn't hypercrit, since hypercrit stacks badly, relatively, with itself, you'll see all relatively low upkeep for massive output. For example, Lust, Envy, and the Lunar Hair weapons quickly get you up to 60, 80, 100% crit chance with just one cast of Time Killer. Serenia Scythe and the Lunar Hair Magic Staff will get you 80, the melee and range weapons will get you 60%, Lust and Envy will get you 100 for fire and, um, for fire and, and earth, excuse me, just forgot. Um, but yeah, just really, really good spell. Definitely my top three, maybe my top one, maybe not for cost, because Pride Lord is so good for being a rare, but eh, it's up there. It's up there. Uh, next item is the Titan's Mug Misk. It's a fire defensive misk that gives, I think, 35 end in luck and a damage boost that starts at 10% and increases to 33% if the monster hits you four times. It also gives 10 immobility resistance. So for what this competes with, it's harder to talk about competition for misks, I think, because there's like 12 fire defensive misks and they all have like a slightly different purpose. Um, or like goal that you use them for, but this one it's just a weird misc because it's a damage misc, but it's situationally awesome and situationally kind of bad, but not like bad, like 10% damage is still good, but you know, like situationally, you'd rather be using another misc. Um, also, I say that like universal damage boosts are common, they're not, there's only like three or four, um, but this one will boost you regardless of element, which is good and it can do up to 10% more than other flat damage misks, which is great, but I just don't know how to feel about it. A lot of monsters don't hit more than two times, and if it hits two times, it's like exactly the same power as uh, normal damage misks, like maybe 1% more, but. And then like the end and luck too, and the immobility resistance, it's all kind of random. It's a good misk to be sure, but for me, I don't know if it has a place, and I, as an ultra rare, I mean, maybe, but, you know, it's, I'd say think about it and be like, how much am I actually going to use this before you buy it? That's, that's all I'll say. I don't know. I really don't know how to feel about this misc. I don't know if it's nuts. I don't know if it's dog water. I don't know if it's okay. I think it's just okay slash good, but you know, Salamander Broodmother. Oh, I've never seen this, this, uh, add on to the name before. Hmm. Cool. Uh, actually, I'll use, I think it's going to be a long fight, so I'll use Soul Gauntlet real quick, just because I happen to have it from something else I was doing last week. Um, but we'll keep talking about the next weapons, which is a Twisted Dragonflyer Sword. It's a fire zero proc melee ranged magic swap weapon that gives either damage or BTH or both for a moderately high SP cost. Um, one, one issue, I say issue, not really an issue, but this is... It has a lot of competition because it's an offensive fire weapon and fire is super highly covered and has a lot of really good gear. Um, Bloodblades exist, I think, gold costs for all three styles. Cake is Bloodblade, the ranged have that Fireheart or Spear, I think. And there's even two, technically, fire 100 proc guns or 100 proc ranged weapons. There's the Blood Gun from Magluin and there's the Fireheart Warbow, which is like a blood weapon, but dials it into a status, so, I mean, technically not, but, you know, what I'm saying is there's a lot of good items for all the builds in fire. That being said, this weapon is different because it pays an SP, um, which is usually pretty unusual for weapons that boost damage, and a lot of people don't like paying SP, but there's definitely going to be a rare situation where paying SP will be better than paying HP for you. 
Um, that being said, it also competes with the pumpkin spice weapons, which do pay SP, and which are just objectively really efficient damage sources if... Ooh, the earth setup. Awesome. Or the earth one. Awesome. Um, it is a really... Pumpkin Spice, because their celerity cost is multiplied by fire resistance in a positive way, um, it's just really hard to beat, like, in my opinion. Really hard to beat the Pumpkin Spice weapons because you get an extra turn for such a cheap cost. Like, I don't know. It's tough. It's tough for me to think that you wouldn't rather have the free-to-play Blood Blades or the Pumpkin Spice weapons for this thing. Alright, I paused and came back, so I kind of lost my thought process, but the only thing I want to say that's great about this weapon is it does have a BTH boost, which is pretty rare, all things considered. Um, so if you're an FO Ranger, you might want that to help supplement your lean, um, lean maxing tactics. But all in all, I think it has too much competition to be worth an ultra rare. It does look sick though, so be that as it may, it looks sick. Next up is a big one, the Void Awakening Armor. It's a neutral fire lean armor, and it has an Ellie Locked Toggle, which does about 1.6x damage, I think, and locks you to fire, of course. The big thing is it also gives Ellie Comp to the Skull Companions. This may be nerfed eventually, but right now it's crazy good. There's also a tiny FSB with the fire shield, but it's, it's dog water, don't worry about it. Um, as for what it competes with, there are a lot of stellar fire armors. Trontosaurus Rex, the Hexbound, Blood Mage and Bloodzerker, Wars Legacy, the Headless Horseman even, Summer Dryad, and even the Akerloth package if you're a big spender. Um, there's just tons of good options. Um, that being said, none of them can multiply pet and guest damage by 1.6. Okay, that's that. The yellow lock damage is significant, but it's also a neutral armor, so it's starting a lot lower than FO armors. Maybe that's a good thing, because you also take a lot less damage, but, you know, it does start a lot lower, so even though 1.66 sounds great, it's less great than it would be as FO. Really, I'd say, in my opinion, although some people disagree, some people really like the Fire Ellie Lock, which is fair, I haven't played with it, I don't have a strong opinion, but I think the strongest reason is to grab it for the 1.66 multiplier on pet and guest damage. And if you don't know what the pet and guest do of the set, to be clear, it only works for the pet and guest of the set. But if you don't know what they do, they're coming up right next. So the Void Awakening Skull companions are fire pets and guests that trade that can trade half their damage to heal SP based off the damage dealt. Uh, and the second mode gives them all they trade all their damage to be a healing pet, but instead of healing, they give a mana or chi shield with their full power. Um, and the pet actually gets a plus 50% damage boost because it invests 78 SP or 104 MP into the Chi or Mana Shield. So it's a little bit scuffed. Um, I don't know exactly how it works. I'll see if I can check it out for you But uh, and put a text screen above this. But on all the pet is gets a big damage boost. They also both have Call and Summon variants. The Call will do the SP Shield. The summon will do the MP shield. I think they might have four variants actually. Call and summon MP and SP. I don't I don't remember, but you'll see when you get in the shop, obviously. And you can swap them in the item upgrader. Um, for competition, there's no other full Chi or Mana Shield guests or pets in the game. So these take the cake for that. That's not fully true. The Azume Golem has a Chi Shield mode, and it's comparable even considering you lose the Misc slot on the Azume Golem, but it's slightly weaker if you have Optico. If it's actually slightly stronger if you have any other pet boosting misc, but all in all, as my golem, you lose a ton of variability, so I definitely like the Void Skull pet way more than as my golem. Um, these guys also have an SP or MP mode regain based off damage dealt, and there's tons of pet and guest boosters to overdrive this healing you get to the moon, and there's tons of really good fire Ellie Bone sources to charge this even more. Probably my top three items within the crossover, definitely, maybe. Yeah, definitely one of my top three in the crossover. And that is pretty much it for the crossover. I think we covered everything. I may have missed an item. If I did, my bad. Let me know in the comments, and I'll put a written description in the uh, 
in the description, actually. Um, but that those are my thoughts on pretty much all of the gear. Definitely look at the info subs first. Definitely get another player's opinion, because again, these are just my opinions. But I think a lot of these items are good for some players. A few of these items are good for pretty much everyone, like Pride Lord, Void Skull Pet and Guest. Um, what's that other one? Infinite Staff. So some of them are just absolutely nuts. Um, oh, and before we go, I want to show you my Wind Pet. I wanted to use the Sphinx Pet, which I haven't used in ages. Um, but. I'm proud of this wind setup. I think it's fun and unique. Uh, we've got the Skeeter draining my HP. We've got the Sphinx inflicting a 39%. Hmm. Stronger than I remember. I don't know if it's every turner has a chance to do that, but... It must be every turn. Huh. Cool. But yeah, that's my thoughts on the Golden Gift Boxes. Thank you for watching. I hope this was helpful. Let me know what you think. And... Important, if you disagree with some of my opinions and views on the items, leave a comment about it so that other newer players can read differing opinions and make their own opinions. Uh, I think that's very helpful, and I would love if some of you guys did that. That being said, though, spread some peace and love, take good care of yourself, and have a great day.